All right. We just got through firing a couple of uh, M14, M1A semi-auto types. Now, in one of our much older videos from several years ago, you saw this rifle once before, but it's changed quite a bit since then. This is a Springfield M1A. It was originally manufactured in February of 1995. It was built from all GI parts, except of course the receiver. It has a Winchester barrel, and I believe the bolt is a Springfield Armory. Not the new one, not ink, but the original Arsenal. Trigger group is TRW. It originally came with a camoed fiberglass stock. In the last video I had it in a birch stock. Now it's wearing a nice walnut with good proofs on it. The DOD stamps here. has a faux selector lock from Sparrow. Really just to fill the hole, and I like that because most of the M14s were uh, limited to semi-auto only. Standard fiberglass handguard. Bayonet lug flash hider unit. Standard flip-up butt plate. Pretty well standard. When I was doing this one, I was going for just the, the M14 look. You know, a full metal jacket type look. And most of you know the history of the M14, and for lots of details, there's a blog article you can refer to. But as you know, this replaced the M1 Grand in 1957. It is a takeoff of the M1 Grand. It's actually a takeoff of the um, the T20, which led to the T37, which led to the T44, and the M14 was the T44E4 which went through trials in 56 and was selected over the T-48, which was the Americanized FAL. But, uh, so it's delineated from the Grand, but it's uh, the gas system is quite a bit different. It's in 7.62 NATO, detachable 20-round magazine. Of course, originally select fire, but most of them were, were restricted to uh, semi-automatic only because of being just horribly uncontrollable. Even in semi-auto, this thing has quite a bit of bark and recoil to it because for what it is, it's pretty lightweight. For an old wood and steel rifle, it's, it is pretty light, so you do feel the, the cartridge going out of it pretty good. That said, it does have a nice trigger. It can be sped by stripper clips, which is kind of an, a throwback, but a neat one. You see the guide there. The barrel is 22 inches. It's a light profile chrome line barrel. Anyway, these were adopted in 57. They started to go into service in 1959. They were manufactured by Springfield, Winchester, TRW, and Harrington and Richards. They only made them for just a few years, but they but they made quite a few. Well over a million. It's in the blog, the exact number. I think it was uh, 1,380,000 something. The final production order was put in 1963 and was uh, completed by TRW in 64 and delivered in 65. So the last brand new M14s were delivered to the military in 1965. So quite a short run. It was a good design in its way. It, it is reliable. But in, it was just too conservative for the late 50s and, and 60s. Again, it was firing a very full power cartridge. It disassembled like the Grand where the trigger group hinges down, which meant it was in a wooden stock, and that gave trouble in Vietnam. That's when the fiberglass was adopted. It had to be restricted to semi-automatic, so that it wasn't really a good uh, battle rifle, except as a semi. Originally, they were hoping it would replace the M1 Grand, the M1 Carbine, the 1918 A2 BAR, and the M3 Grease Gun. In the end, it replaced the Grand fine. It did okay at replacing them on carbine, but not great. But it was horrible at replacing the uh, BAR and the Grease Gun. It just did not make a good submachine gun or LMG substitute. So it was just, it wasn't a radical enough design. Again, it was reliable, but as far as its accuracy, it seems like it was pretty temperamental. If everything was aligned properly, it was fine, but because this is all one unit up here and it just slides onto the barrel and is tightened down with this castle nut, 
if it got out of alignment, it, you know, your sight would shift and then your flash shutter would shift, which would just change your point of impact and some other, you know, things. I'm not trying to disparage the gun. It's an American classic, but there's been a mythos that has grown up around it that is just, it's just not true. It's a great gun, but it had its limitations. I think in a lot of ways, it's a better civilian gun than ever was a military gun. It was so long and heavy for Vietnam, and they couldn't carry enough rounds. I have to admit, I think the M16 was the better gun for Vietnam. That said, for my personal collection, I wanted one of these for years. I had kind of that hole between my AR-15 and my Grand, and I was really thrilled to find that all GI parts uh, Springfield M1A. It's been 100% reliable. It is a lot of fun to shoot with a nice trigger. It does have more felt recoil than an FAL or a G3. I think that's because it doesn't have a pistol grip and it is pretty lightweight. So just that we'd share again. I've changed it since you saw it last and it's been a couple of years and the last video wasn't of such a high quality. But uh, just another good uh, M1A, M14 type clone. We'll move on. And to go along with the standard M14 clone, we have an M14 E2 or M14 A1 pre and post adoption names, uh, SAW or LMG variant. Now, the M14 E2 came about starting around 1962-63. In the early, or excuse me, in the late 50s, when the T44 E4 was being adopted. There was also a heavy barreled version called the T44 E5, which was adopted in 1957 as the M15. It was the same as an M14, except it had a heavier barrel. It had a bipod similar to this one, and it was meant to be an LMG. Well, they decided it really wasn't necessary, that it didn't really give any improvements over a standard M14 with the same bipod added, so they dropped it in 59. But it quickly became apparent that the standard M14 just could not be a saw, couldn't be an LMG. So, starting in 62, 63, the Army unofficially started kind of going and, and adapting things. They did come up with a pistol grip stock that they made. They put a commercial butt pad on it made of rubber. They used the same bipod that's been around for a while and so on and so forth. They came up with a folding wood grip, uh, forearm grip. And, uh, you know, the higher-ups began to take notice, and one of them they continued developing it in 63, and that's what resulted in the E2. That's when this folding rubber coated foregrip came to be. Folds down as you see very easily and you just squeeze a button here to uh, fold it back up and then you just pull on the sling to unfold it. It's kind of nice. It's actually adjustable. I don't know if you can see on the camera but there's these holes in the stock that are filled by rubber plugs. This thing is held on by two screws and you can either move it up here, down, it's it's second to the least or the lowest, well not because of me being short, but it's actually adjustable. Not readily, of course, you have to take it out of the stock and unscrew it, but it was able to be customized for the uh, for the soldiers by moving it up and down. So that was one element that was adapted for the LMG. There's also the M2 bipod. Now this one's a replica from Springfield because originals are awfully expensive and this is what I could come across, but it's a respectably good replica, especially for a shooter. It's um, just a pretty standard bipod. It just has a button. These legs fold down. They're adjustable, which is kind of nice. Now, the on the end of the barrel, it has what they call the stabilizer, which basically turned the flash hider into a muzzle brake. And it just slides over the existing flash hider and is ported. And it's ported asymmetrically to help stabilize recoil for a right-handed shooter. And it actually locks on the bayonet lug. You can see there's two nuts here. It uses the same wrench that d adjusts the gas system. And it just you just screw these down and lock it on to the uh, bayonet lug. These were most often issued with the, vent the older style ventilated handguard for easier barrel cooling. They were still issued with the standard 20 round mags. The forearm was made a little thicker. It was actually cut from the same blank as the M14 stock, but they didn't trim it down as much in the forearms. It's a little bit heavier due to your forearm. It had a pistol grip grafted on. It's actually uh, kind of dovetailed and cemented into place quite solidly. This one has a faux or 
selector switch from Fulton. I like it a lot. It works well and really completes the look. This one's built from GI Parts on a Han rewelded receiver. Uh, I know those are controversial, but I had an opportunity to get one and I went with it. The rest of the parts are Harrington and Richards too. This is a real E2 stock purchased as a new old stock from a Treeline Enterprises. I can highly recommend their services and uh, Randy over there is just a, a great guy. Very kind and responsive. This is one of his reproduction rubber butt plates because the originals on these stocks are just so old and stiff now for shooting I wanted to have a reproduction on it. It's a great reproduction. Looks exactly like an original. This is an original butt plate as you can tell by the wear but I might get it reparked. I may not. Another interesting feature of the E2 is that the sling swivel actually swivels to the side 90 degrees so it can be side slung and the sling itself is actually about 10 inches maybe 15 I'm not sure longer and it has a double hook to go through the uh, the foregrip here. Now why they thought that had to be hooked on I mean there's a whole manual of arms about how that was supposed to be utilized and everything but that's that was the idea. It definitely makes it neat. But yeah, these were used as LMGs uh, in Vietnam. They started to go over there around 65. And uh, they initially ordered over 8,000. They were relatively well received, so they ordered 2,000 more. So there were about 10,000 in theater from 66 through about 72. They began to be phased out by the M60. Originally they supported the M14. Later they supported the M16. Now, they still didn't have a quick change barrel, so they would overheat. There was no real difference there between that and the regular M14. However, because of the pistol grip stock, the stabilizer, and the foregrip, they were a lot easier to control in uh, fully, fully automatic. And the extra weight, because of the bipod and stock being heavier, helped a lot. And I can say from just shooting the, these back to back, the, the E2 is a, is a lot tamer to fire and a lot more fun to fire. As a side note, these stocks, or most of these, especially these birch ones, were actually made up in Canada by the old uh, Long Branch factory, which became uh, Canadian Arms Limited. So it's just kind of, uh, kind of funny that they, they made these for the U.S. military. But yeah, these were in service during Vietnam. They were limitedly successful uh, saw types. Probably more successful than the standard M14 over there, honestly, because at least they gave good suppressive fire and... Uh, you know, that way the M16 guys could pick off people with good aim shots and, you know, the, the guy with one of these could keep, keep the enemy's heads down. But, uh, yeah, about 10,000 were made and most all of them saw really heavy service over in Nam. You can see a lot of well-used stocks, uh, E2 stocks, A1 stocks. Oh, speaking of A1, the, yeah, I forgot to mention, sorry, that in 1966 these were officially adopted and, and type classified as the M14A1. Same configuration, there's no difference. And all the M14E2s and M14A1s were conversions from standard uh, M14s. They just issued uh, conversion kits. But something you don't see too many of, and I'm really proud to have this. It took me several years to collect all the parts and build one up. And This one is all GI, just like the previous one you saw. And then I found the stock from Treeline and then bought the reproduction bipod and reproduction stabilizer because originals are just god-awful expensive and I like to shoot. So I didn't want to put wear and tear on an original. But yeah, I just thought we'd share today. Come out on a nice day to shoot some 308. Thanks for tuning in.